hands out. We just try to mute the horse, and that's it. Push it away, and she comes back. She's not completely scared. She just doesn't know. Sergeant Bysaf coming in to uh, give his advice and uh, catch a horse if it uh, if it does take off. So this is a better demonstration perhaps of how the, the training happened. Reva took to it like a duck to water, but uh, Lulu, she needs a bit more persuasion. We had a really big ball last year, we had a really big ball mark one last year. And this would have been going on throughout remote depots in the First World War. The soldiers and the personnel at the remote depots were experienced horsemen. Often they were older men, so that's why Ricky fits in. Often they were older men who uh, may not want to uh, be able through physical uh, animals were on the Royal, uh, Royal Army Veterans Corps anniversary parade uh, in Melton Mowbray just a few weeks ago, and also men of the Army Service Corps. Uh, we'll discuss the numbers of horses and mules in the First World War, but the vast majority of horses in the First World War were not with the cavalry, they were actually with transportation, and that's where the Army Service Corps come in, and it's the logistical arm. So most soldiers, most of the soldiers, the majority of them, who served with horses and mules in the First World War were actually moving stuff. Uh, transportation, haulage and that sort of thing. They weren't in the cavalry. The cavalry was only about 60, 70,000 strong uh, at any time in the First World War. They didn't have time to be nice about it. You know, they, they basically got them in and uh, you know, broke them to harness or broke them to saddle, whatever they were going to be used for, and shipped them out to the Western Front. Some of the remount depots were quite small affairs. But, and, um, your methods, but this was the original way of doing it. The reason why we haven't done this before is the fact it took me quite a long time to find somewhere that actually makes one of these things anymore. I don't want to push it too much because we can't go up against the, uh, the railings too hard. It's a slow process. These horses that came in from North America, the uh, Canadian and the... And the um... See, Maggie don't mind. Maggie doesn't mind it. There you go. That's what you call push ball. The horse is pushing the ball, not me. So the horses that came in, we you could never tell. Quickest and best is the preferred method of getting onto a horse. It's basically hopping up. Do you want me to hold the head or not? He's going to do it hardcore. Come on, Matt. There you go. Round of applause, there, ladies and gentlemen. That's quickest and best. Charlie, keep the ball down the far end for a minute while um, Rick gets up. see now ladies and gentlemen why this game was very popular as a training aid with both the cavalry and the, the, police, the mounted police. Um, it's very effective. So this, this is the sort of thing that they would have used for horses for Malay. Don't crush it Palmer. Just keep it down there guys. Works a treat doesn't it Gary? Yeah, for now. So for those of you who have stayed here for a couple of minutes, or 20 minutes have been watching this, when you saw the horses first initially, you know, a couple of minutes ago, none, you know, very few of them were going to go in and get used to it, and now look, they're pushing it around like a good one. Even Luna's getting involved. out there, Charlie, he, uh, he plays polo quite often. Uh, he's from Jersey and he plays polo. Uh, what's the chances of us getting onto a polo ground before uh, a game, uh, Charlie? What do you think? I think it would go down well, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then...
Well done, Tony. You got her right there now. She's star player. Like, I'm not too sure what the uh, rules are with push ball about uh, hoof. Was it um, hoof ball? Yeah. Watch it, watch it, Bo. That's it. 